Having the film at Woodstock was a very special experience. With um, It was my first time at any film festival in the US, and it was great to be welcomed with such a warm, such a warm environment. The selection and the films that I went to see and other filmmakers that I got the chance to, to meet and to, and to talk and to sort of share experiences and passions and find a kindred connection with so many people was really special for me. Thank you for joining us for the Woodstock Film Festival Let's Talk Film podcast. I'm your host, Katie Mejia. Today, we're joined by cinematographer and director Stephen Jared Kelly. Thanks for joining us, Stephen. Thank you for having me, Katie, and thanks to all your listeners. Absolutely. So just a little bit about the Woodstock Film Festival. It was established in 2000, and this year we are having the festival on October 15th to the 20th. So make sure you submit your film. So highly recommend that you do not wait to the last minute. This is our 25th year coming up. So it's a big year. Um, the Woodstock Film Festival is a haven for networking with high caliber industry members, voting members of the Academy, filmmakers, musicians, and fiercely independent artists like Steven. So I just wanna kick it off with my first question, which is you had your US premiere of uh, your film, your documentary film, In the Shadow of Beirut. So what was that experience like coming from Ireland and, and being here in Woodstock? Having the film at Woodstock was a very special experience. Right from registering for my badge, I immediately started talking. I think I met you. You were one of the first people who I met. And then in a same... Oh, that's right. I saw the ginger and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. the ginger and the Irish. Exactly. I got talking to Pamela Yates. I got talking to a whole lot of other people who I'd heard of some of the people and some of the people I hadn't heard of just because I haven't been around the documentary film, film world for that long. Um, this is my first feature film. And I, you know, just really good energy, good people, quality, independent film. Um, I'm drawn towards towards the documentary field more. So the selection and the films that I went to see and other filmmakers that I got the chance to to meet and to and to talk and to sort of share um, experiences and passions and find a kindred connection with so many people was really special for me. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a great experience. Um, yeah, I mean, it was great having you. And this was your U.S. premiere in the Shadow Beirut. You're a first time director, but you are mostly you were prior to that, mostly a cinematographer. So can you tell us how you made this film? Because I know at sure. first it was you living there. You can tell us how you ended up in Beirut, but then you, you shot it. And then it's sort of you, you know, you can tell us there was how you, you assembled the team and put it all together. Sure, sure. I know the great questions and there's a lot in there in how I how I ended up in Beirut was in 2015. My partner, a, a bright um, Bronx-born Puerto Rican woman, um, got a job in Beirut. And basically, at that stage, we'd been doing a distance thing for a few years. And she said to me, look, either you're moving with me or we're going to finish this. Uh, so with that ultimatum and me recognizing um, that my life was better with her in it than it was without. I decided to move to Beirut from New York City, which is which, which is where I was living for five years and where we met. And um, yeah, so I moved to Beirut following her. And then by pure luck, I made friends with somebody from the area, from one of the neighborhoods where the film is set. And I developed quite a quite a good friendship, a good uh, repertoire that um, like through that person, he brought me into his family who had a matriarch at the top of the family um, who was so kind and welcoming and patient with me, having uh, 
I didn't speak any Arabic when I arrived there. So I spent the sort of first three years learning Arabic um, and, and immersing myself in a community where people didn't speak English. Um, nobody in the film speaks English. And I, I, I was with the people in the film over a period of five years and sort of at the three year mark, being able to navigate daily life and, and uh, understand more and um, sort of people at times of celebration and times of hardship um, would encourage me to photograph, to film, um, you know, be it a childbirth, be it a wedding, be it a funeral, um, you know, I sort of became like the, among the community, like the, like a, like a permanent fixture, you know, and sort of at the three year mark was when I started to actively film up until then I barely took out the camera because I wanted to understand fully what was happening. And also there's a, an immense amount of trust both ways, but especially with people in front of the camera that, um, you know, I'm coming in as a foreigner with immense privilege around firstly having a camera, having a passport and being able to, to decide of my own free will to move to Lebanon, albeit with an ultimatum from my partner. But, um, I was very cognizant and careful in like every interaction, you know, and friendships that developed over years. And I never set out to make a film, you know, so it was only after living there for five years, leaving with hundreds of hours of footage on hard drives and then sit, sitting in Kingston, New York, planning to then edit something. I didn't know what, but then realizing that the task at hand was so great that to take that on single-handedly without bringing in more experienced people, um, Lebanese production partners, Lebanese editors, um, international people who could get funding and really come together as a team, working carefully with the people in front of the camera, my friends, to make sure that what what was edited on the final film is a very honest, true, and heartfelt um, piece of work. In the Shadow of Beirut was Ireland, is Ireland's selection for the Oscars in the category of Best International Feature Film. And okay. In the Shadow of Beirut is also up for shortlisting in the documentary feature. I want to just play the trailer here because it's so just beautiful and epic. صور مقلقة لتداعيات الانفجارات القاتلة في منطقة مرفأ بيروت. نيرتنا ما بقى لا قيمة ولا بتعمل شيء. دمرت بيروت. أكثر منطقة ما فيها قانون، فقيرة مكان في منطقة بيروت. <تصفيق> نحن تقريبا 30 ألف شخص محصورين بيجيروا متر مربع الواحد كأنه نحن مش موجودين هلا أنا أولاد بنشتغل طول النهار الساعة السابعة في الساعة تسعة بالليل هم بهذا المجتمع بالأخص يعني ما لازم تقولي مراهقة إذا حدا مرض من أولادي هلا ممكن يموت قدام عيوني وما أقدر فوت مستشفى طبيعة الحياة بطبيعة آسيا وصعبة بس نحن لازم نكون أقوى Thank 
كم من الفرح جاء بعد الحزن So, okay, now we're back around. And just by the way, this is also an opportunity for you to watch this film virtually through the Woodstock Film Festival on Tuesday. Do you want to plug that? Absolutely. If you go to the Woodstock Film Festival, and I'll put the information in the, the description of how you can watch a Q&A and see the film itself virtually. So look out for that information. And so let's get into this. So you're saying that you were literally living in Beirut. You were like there. I mean, what was your reality every day? I was a 20 minute bike ride from Sabra and Shatila. So in a, in a better area, in a, in a better home with, with more frequent electricity, with water that we got from tanks, you know, um, a, a tanker would come and fill up our water tanks, but our life was easier and more comfortable than what you see in the film. Beirut is a very um, sectarian, segregated city with a lot of wealth and world renowned for for fashion, for partying, for tourism. Um, it's a beautiful country, you know, um, where the mountains reach the sea and at times of the year you can be on a beach and see and see snow um covered mountains and go skiing but but the reality for hundreds of thousands of families um is not that it's very far away from that um, and what the film shows is sort of two areas that that grew out of um the 1948 exodus of Palestinian refugees um, from Palestine in the face of um, violence from the sort of nascent and active Zionist m movement. Um, and then subsequent decades um, of Israeli occupation in the south of the country pushed the Shiite communities up into the city as well and because often the lowest and um, economically poorest areas of the city were next to the Palestinian communities who um, you know so the Shiite communities would then who were forced out of the south of the country um, from conflict and violence would then settle next to Shatila which is the Sabra neighborhood in the film. So that's like a, a bit of background, but and sort of explains a little bit about the city and how very different uh, different parts are. You know, you've got your Christian communities, you've got your Sunni, your Shiite, your Druze communities that that are often mixed, but then sometimes there's bigger percentages of one community over the other. And then belonging to one community or having a particular family name impedes how you move through the city and um, affects your interactions you know and maybe some of the choices that you make and as an outsider not belonging to any of the, those particular groups you know I was um, and moving solo meant that I could move a lot freer and I was a bit of an anomaly in people's um, you know reality you you were just this person that sort of popped up out of nowhere and was like asking them questions yeah yeah no like i mean having haven't taken such time and years to understand what was you know happening that that i would move from one area into another area and where i was coming where i was leaving would warn me don't go in there steve you know like they're going to do serious harm to you and then thanking the people that were giving me the advice and thank you, um, we'll see you t tomorrow. I would then walk straight in knowing that, 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 that the people who were receiving me, um, I'll be protecting you. Being, yeah. a being in a very tough environment, um, that I was under no um, grave risk, you know, and then the people, receiving me also saying, what were you doing over there? You know, you, you can't be in there, it's not safe. 
Um, but by so you basically time, just had kind of had like angels sort of watching over you, but it was because they trusted, they, they sort of, you built a rapport with them and you have a, a, you know, you have like a humanity to yourself. One other person I had on the podcast, Rick Rowley, he's also like a war journalist and he's been in really crazy places too. And I could tell it's like, you guys have similar personalities. It's this ability to sort of gain people's trust, but then you also have like, you know, humanity and like a big heart and like the ground, you have a grounding centeredness and you also have like a little bit of street smart. I mean, obviously like for you to be in dangerous places and to film and to get the stories, you just have to be a particular type of person. I mean, it's like not for everybody to be able to do that. But in like with him, he said he actually at one point and you can watch one of the episodes with him, I highly recommend. And, you know, he's been a part of the festival for a while, but he he's definitely like traumatized, too. And I just want to ask you that I mean, because he actually saw someone sort of like actually a child pass away in the car with him because he was in Iraq during the insanity of that insanity and knows, you know, about the war torn sort of like scenarios in the Middle East that are purposely set up so that, you know, the war machine can continue to sell arms. And, you know, I mean, you're, the stories that you're that you're documenting here, you have like, f I guess it's five different stories, very intimate, character driven stories. And you were able to, you know, get these different stories and then bring it sort of all together. I'm just curious, like how that happened as well. I mean, I know you were gaining their trust, you're there. How did you go about sort of, you know, developing these five different stories as opposed to maybe one or two? Just to answer the emotional part, um, a lady, a Lebanese woman in the audience at the Woodstock US premiere um, went to ask a question and couldn't physically get the question out and then set me off on stage and such was the emotion. So I definitely don't want, I definitely don't want to try and avoid that here. But what I would say is that, yes, um, my friends are dear to me in Sabra and Shatila and Beirut in general. It was five years of my life that will never leave me. And I'm still in regular contact with everybody who's in the film and wider circles of Beirut um, and the country, Lebanon. I had a son who was born there, um, which uh, again, you know, it, it, it's always going to be a very special place for me and my family. I, I had been actively filming with uh, 10 families, you know, so, so, the, so the final four families that are in the film um, are from a much wider pool like that. Again, it wasn't, it, it was probably approached in a very inefficient way because it was, it was just about being human was the most important thing to me and just connecting with people learning so like the hundreds of hours of footage are from a tiny fraction of the time that the camera was turned on when i was there i like from 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 five probably less than five percent of my time in sabra and shatila was the camera turned on 95 percent of the time easily was just being there with people um in with 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 so many other people, so even the ten families that I was actively filming with, there are so many more that I spent like years getting to know and understanding, and um, that's that's what my Beirut time was. You know, it was just with friends and being educated. So so to arrive at the point of like selecting the stories, which goes back to your comment or your question was that um, in the edit by getting good local Lebanese production company Aboud Productions on board with Miriam Sassin who is awesome um, producer and getting a Lebanese editor with Zaina Abul Hassan and then teaming up with with an Irish centered team who had great success with their film Gaza which premiered at Sundance in 2019 was Ireland's selection for the Best International Feature for the Oscars the, um, in, in 2020. Um, by, by like getting together a team and then putting funding in place, in the edit was really where the team came together. Gary Keane did an incredible job in bringing in sort of a very you know structured narrative head that I was 
so deep in all the stories and knew all the background off camera that Gary and forever indebted to came in with like sensitivities around what would work in a feature length film. And then with Isolt and with Zaina, our Irish and our Lebanese editors, both uh, incredible women who brought great sen- you know, great sens- sensitivities to the edit um, because women are, were such stoic, brave, inspirational people in the film that I had the opportunity to get to know being that anomaly, you know, that within the communities there, it would be very rare for a non-male family member to be alone with a woman. Um, but because husbands and fiancés trusted me to the point where they would go off to work and leave me alone with their wife, you know, in the house, and we would just be spending time together. And then so I really got the female perspective, which took took time, but it was just this uh, organic interaction that, you know, Ikram would often say to me, the mother of Sana, who got engaged, um, Ikram would always say to me, Steve, you're nearly like a therapist, you know, like uh, I tell you everything. And then Rabia, who was the mother of Saria, um, Rabia would also say to me, Steve, you know, you hear things that, you know, are only in our family, like that nobody else, like even people, like even people in our family don't know everything and you're just here, you know, and we trust you and we tell you everything, you know? And so it was very, uh, very humbling. Yeah. It's very intimate. You can tell, I mean, it's, it's, it's so amazing that we're able to, it is filmmaking can be like a therapy, you know, session, not only for the person who's in it. I mean, I've had this conversation with so many filmmakers on this podcast you know, we have somebody on that was made a film about PTSD. So you can only imagine like you're in the session recording somebody who's getting help. I mean, you're literally it's it, it becomes like blurred the lines where you're not even necessarily art is therapy. Therapy is art. And you're also telling the world and showing the world the injustice that needs to be told. And that's also one of my next questions is when something like this comes out, do you think there is and that many films can have an impact, but with the government and with whatever's happening, is there, I mean, I know that wasn't part of the the film's, you know, the message of the film. It wasn't like, oh, we're exposing all of this. We're just bringing humanity to the situation. But I wanted to ask about that part. You know, what do you see given what's going on right now with Palestine and Israel? Um, you know, anything that would change the situation because it just seems to be this ongoing ridiculous, you know, inhumane, unnecessary, so many words to describe why war is happening in this area. Is there anything that you sort of, your ideas that you have on it and how to maybe resolve some of the situation? Sure, sure. No, very valid points and very relevant currently given the terrible violence that started on October the 7th. Lessons from the film are that, you know, if you, if we just give a little bit of space to show more compassion and understand a little bit, you know, the lives that people live on all different sides of the, of the conflict in, in, in Lebanon, when I lived there, I felt I felt a, a lot of anger against the institutions, both national and international, that were responsible for the conditions and the lives that people in the film led and 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 fought through, that are symbolic of of, of hundreds of thousands of people living very similar lives in. Lebanon and then regionally millions of people. So it was, it, it mixed my, my emotions mixed be, between despair and anger and distress 
Um, but it was always questioning why why aren't the people out on the street screaming? Why aren't and and it's 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 down to the manipulation of of people who have the power of keeping people more separate because they're weaker that way than they are if they come together. Now, at the end of 2019, there was this very um, real natural protest movement when the local currency started to lose its uh, value and the Ponzi scheme that is the Lebanese uh, economy started to crumble and people came out from all different sects and communities to protest uh, as one. But when people in power saw that as a threat to their um, their continuity, um, they then came in and broke it up, and it sort of became messier and less pure. And um, infiltration. That, I mean, that's what happens yeah, every time. Totally. All of the protest movements get infiltrated, totally. and people don't even know. Yeah, yeah, and they just pit people against each other somehow to break it down, like the Black Panther yeah. Party, pretty example. But I mean, there's so many you know ways yeah. that they can can do that and divide and conquer. But yeah. I think it's, it is, uh, my question is to also, why aren't people out in the street all the time protesting? What I mean, just it's so many different things, but it's because they do, we do have this level of like uh, manipulation where we, we just don't know our own sovereignty and power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I'll, we've got to wrap this up, but I want to ask one final question. And that is how in the world did you put this together funding wise? How did, did Ireland, you know, fund it and how did you bring, I know you brought this incredible team together, but how did that part happen? Sure. Sure. Uh, great question. Getting the team together and the funding in place was a lot of it was down to Brendan Byrne, who was the producer behind Gaza and Brendan brought immense energy and determination to getting the film done. He, we worked with Gary Keane um, through Screen Ireland, who funded through Arte and ZDF, um, who also gave a sizable amount um, to the funding structure. And then that's what we started with. And we went into um, filling in the gaps in the story by two subsequent filming trips back to Beirut, where I brought Gary with me for the first time. So having been there for five years solo, I then brought Gary back who um was was once I once I ensured his security um and that he'd be coming in with me uh, to people's homes and people would see him on the street and um he really you know was such a welcome creative um anchor for me as well you know and like seeing how he um moved and he helped with audio and then we you know it really began to gain momentum then as we figured out where the gaps were and then we went in very targeted okay we need to get a bit more audio or a bit more footage here and then in post you know we were sort of the budget was at a point where we needed more and then brendan uh knows siobhan sinerton um who was a producer on for sana which was a very highly acclaimed beautiful documentary about a woman giving living through and giving birth in wartime Syria and when Brendan mentioned Siobhan to me and you know how she would how how she's really interested in coming on board with Hidden Light and um, which is the Clintons um, per production company and um, Siobhan came on board and as another woman with sensitivities around the Arab world given the work that she's done before um, a very modest sum was given from Hidden Light to finish off um, some of the post. And that's sort of how Hidden Light came on board. And they didn't have any editorial decision-making power in how the stories were told. And by talking internally with, with people in the film and then with our Lebanese production partners, um, everybody involved, you know, ZDF from Germany, Arte, um, Screen Ireland, everybody coming together and deciding, do we want to take this modest sum to finish, which we need, or do we want to wait and continue to like postpone the film going out into the world? 
and it was decided collectively um, as a team that it was more important to to team up with Hidden Light to get the film out into the world, given the urgency of it and given that no one should continue to live one extra day in the conditions that people in the film live. So, 100%. I mean, there's, there is a real urgency. And then, of course, you know, just the Middle East being in the perpetual sort of state of war. I mean, it's, it's unnecessary and so tragic. And whatever we can do, you know, and like you said, we, we have some level of power, but I feel like filmmaking is, is one of the most powerful and whether or not it's, it really has an impact like directly. I feel like psychologically it really does, which is where they really get us. So we have to, you know, we have to keep doing that because that's the, the beauty and the power. And I wish you the best in this Oscar run. And I know that folks are going to tune in on Tuesday November 14th, folks are going to tune in November 14th to a virtual screening and Q&A with um, yourself. And can you tell yes. us who else is going to join? Miriam Sassine of Aboot Productions, our Lebanese production partner, is going to also dial in from Lebanon. Fantastic. That's going to be incredible that they're going to be literally in Lebanon and we're going to be able to connect with them over the interwebs. So that information will be in the description. You can just get tickets. It's free. And we hope you will join us for that. And so that's it for this episode of the Woodstock Film Festival. Let's Talk Film Podcast. Thanks again, Stephen. So appreciate you taking your time. Beautiful film. And we're going to, you know, 100% push it. And I'm looking forward to any of the films that you do in the future. Because it sounds like you've got some stuff in the works as well. It's going to be incredible. So... Once again, don't forget to like and subscribe to this video. Everyone's going to share this lovely video podcast everywhere. We're also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and other podcasting platforms. And so that is it for this episode, and we will see you next time. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Take care. Take care. Peace.